Welcome back to another month of the PigX podcast. I'm your host, Delaney Howell. Sustainability measures are being implemented across the industry, both nationwide and globally. As Tom Baddeley's later shares, the sustainability movement was originally started due to regulatory requirements. However, over the years, it's really started to evolve. When we look to our counterparts across the pond, Europe has also had long-time measures in place to push farmers to focus on what they can do from an environmental standpoint. Today, during our episode, we'll hear from two industry experts discussing this impact both domestically and abroad. We turn the conversation over to Shane McAuliffe, an Irish hog farmer and lecturer in agricultural sciences, to share a little bit about the EU's perspective of reducing their environmental footprint of pork production. I originally, um, I've, I've come from a pig farm. Um, my family have been involved in pigs since the 19, uh, late 1950s. Where my grandfather originally came from was a very mountainous area, um, very heavy land, black peaty soils, um, and he knew he wasn't going to make any money out of milking cows. So eventually he, um, he built a chicken house, actually, and that burnt down one night. And he was going to the UK for the winters, working in the beet harvest, saving up money. And he eventually saved up money to uh, build, buy a pickup truck in the late 50s. Then he started uh, transporting uh, pigs for local people. Then he bought a few pigs himself. And um, he started growing that more and more. And then in 1970, he made a very brave decision and built uh, a 100 sow unit, which at the time was very much unheard of. And that grew more than in the 70s and 80s to where we are today. So we've, we've 2,000 sows on four different sites and also beef, beef cows as well. So that I, farming is, is in my blood. Yeah, yeah. But you also have some roles outside of just the mm-hmm. agricultural farming space as well. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so, um, you know, originally I went to college to study agriculture and I thought, look, if I hate it, I'll leave after two years because if you, if you become a young trained farmer in Ireland, you can like receive grants and subsidies and things like that. So I said, right, I'll leave after two years if I hate it. So I did my three years for my degree. Then I spent another year and did my honours degree. Then I went to Wales to do a postgrad in livestock sciences. Then I went to the Royal Vet College to do my master's in pig health and production. <laughs> so I've always kept doing more and more and I'm looking at doing a PhD now, but I've always worked off farm as well. So I worked in the veterinary industry for a few years um, with a company that were the uh, distributors of SIVA and HIPRA vaccines. Um, I was working in welfare for a time and, and working with a biotechnology company with, with pig products in the Netherlands. And with the last year or so, I'm, I'm a lecturer now in Munster Technological University in Agricultural Sciences. So that's, um, that's what I'm doing now. So I've always had stuff off farm to, to keep me busy. Yes, you certainly stay busy, it sounds like. And uh, you spend a lot of time giving presentations and lectures to people in the industry, people outside of the industry, it sounds like as well. But at the Iowa Swine Day, you focused on discussing the topic about how Europe is going about reducing the environmental footprint in swine and livestock production. That's a big order to fill. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, I was thinking, uh, how will I talk about this in my presentation? How will I, you know, discuss it in detail? And then I thought, right, let's just look at it in, as in general with the European uh, green deal the farm to fork strategy and then let's look at some of the major pig producing countries and what they're doing so spain um the netherlands denmark and, and a bit on ireland and then a little bit about what we're doing at home on my own farm so that's what i had aimed to do and hopefully uh, it was well received <laughs> yeah and so you mentioned that really driving sustainability was the green deal the european green deal For those of our listeners, I'm sure most people have heard about it, but give us a little more detail about that Green Deal and what its goals are, what it hopes to accomplish. Yeah, so basically the European Green Deal was approved in 2020, and it's a policy to make Europe the first carbon neutral continent in the world. So it's looking at lots of different sectors and and different industry and, and basically making them more sustainable. And again, when it comes to um, agriculture, we have what's called the farm uh, to fork strategy. And again, this is making um, agriculture carbon neutral, um, producing safe, um, nutritious food, and and so on. So basically, this is what's driving the agenda in Europe at the moment. It's this EU policy. But again, what we see in the different countries is some are very much pro-agriculture, some not so much. So it it varies between the, the European countries as to how they're 
pushing for sustainability. You know, like I mentioned, Spain, again, their, their government is very, very pro-agriculture. The Spanish pig industry is very, very big, um, uh, important player in the economy. The same for Denmark. Um, the pig sector is the biggest se agricultural sector in Denmark. So you'll see a lot of them, um, you know, their, their restrictions aren't as... Um, as strict as let's say the Netherlands of course which is which is very very topical um, but yeah it, it varies between the different countries certainly. So was the farm to fork strategy um, an effect of the Green Deal which came first? Mm -hmm. Yeah so the Green Deal came first and then they have the, the farm to fork strategy as part of the European Green Deal. So you mentioned Spain, the Netherlands, Ireland obviously mm -hmm. being that your home country, yeah. um, Denmark etc. Were these countries already thinking ahead to, you know, sustainability, the Green New Deal, or as you talked about today, did some of the practices shift once that was signed? Yeah, we can definitely see that. Um, you know, for example, I think the most ambitious targets is coming from Denmark. You know, they're planning to be carbon neutral by 2050. They want all soya to be sustainably um, produced by 2025, the, the soya that they import. Um, they're looking at ensuring that all Danish pigs are loose housed, including the, the sows. They want all Danish pigs to have intact tails. So the Danes particularly have very, very ambitious climate targets. Um, Spain, again, you know, Spain are the, the powerhouse of pork in Europe. And, you know, I mentioned in my presentation that there are issues there with the environment, but we're looking at the fact that the um, the livestock density in Spain is, is lower than the EU average. Um, you know, 50, over 50% 50 of the pigs in Spain is um, situated in, in Aragon and in Catalonia. So you have vast areas of Spain with no pigs. So, you know, while they're restricted in those areas, there's a lot of other areas that they can really pump up pork production. Um, and then in Germany, again, we're seeing contraction there because of African swine fever and welfare regulations. Um, contractions in Poland as well um, so it, yeah it really varies between um, the different countries um, and a lot of them are doing a lot of different things you know Denmark like I mentioned biogas Germany quite big on the bioca biogas as well um, France beginning to look at it more and in Ireland now this year it's, we're finally looking at biogas as well as you know short you know small scale projects but it's it's finally on the agenda yeah yeah I was surprised to learn the pork powerhouse that Spain really was and the integrated model that they have which it sounds like is a little unique maybe from other European countries. Yes, very much so and, and that was ve very much because Spain was an outlier in Europe. The Franco regime only ended in 1975 so they were you know they really weren't friends with anyone and they were looking at the the US model of integration and that's how that started to develop there in Spain um, and again you know they joined the European Union in 1985, 1986, and um, you know they got more money then as a country. The capita spending increased, and, and there was actually more pork consumption because people were able to afford better foods. So um, you know the European Union did have a big part to play in, in Spain, helping them move along, re eradicate African swine fever, and, and so on. But yeah, Spain is is really phenomenal at the moment, and. We're seeing a growth in the integrators. We're seeing less independent farmers. They're being bought up by the integrators. And the integrators, they, um, you know, they supply the feed. They own the pigs. They um, own the slaughterhouses. So they have the money to invest in those farms um, to, you know, make them more sustainable and new, to use new technologies, improved animal health, and, and so on. Now, you mentioned each of those countries really has their own unique system of how they raise pork. But as we look at the Green New Deal, the farm to fork strategy, et cetera, do you think that there will be a standard system or a standard model that's going to be coming to the forefront in Europe? Yeah, I, c I think we can even see that because a lot of, um, uh, in terms of, of the politicians in Europe and so on, we're, you know, there are a lot, um, lot very much focused on comparing us to the Scandinavians. And Sweden has you no know, farrowing crates. Um, Finland has intact tails, um, so this, this, the Scandinavian model is very, very much different. It's much smaller farms, um, you know, that is what they're pushing. Intact tails, that's very, very controversial. It's so topical at the moment, the last few years in, in the European Union. And again, the farrowing crates, um, so they're looking at what the Scandinavians are doing and 
you know, at the end of this year now, we will get a, f a date when the European Commission aims to phase out borrowing rates. Um, again, it's impossible to, to know what that will be um, because, you know, within any country, they have a specific number of companies who work with pig equipment and pig buildings. So only one of those companies can retrofit a certain number of pig farms every year. So it's virtually impossible to give us 10 years to phase out farming crates because, you know, even if we have the labor or the expertise, it's just not possible to, to do it. It really, really isn't. Um, it's a steep learning curve. Um, but it's, it's what's coming down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's why at home we decided to um, bring that in on one of the farms, our 600 saw unit, about um, almost 10 years ago now. We, we knew that that farm had to be renovated, so we said, right, let's, let's develop this system. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of a steep learning curve, I think, especially in here in the United States, as we're starting to talk more about carbon and carbon neutrality, I was interested to learn that Ireland is, has the lowest carbon footprint yes, in the is. EU. So I'm sure that took a long time to get to that process. Yeah, yeah th we, we certainly do. So I think it's it's 4.8 kilos um, CO2 equivalent per kg of pork, and the EU average is around six kilos. So we're, we're just below, and almost all the others are at six kilo, but we're that slightly bit lower. And again, we're starting a new project in Ireland with Chagas, our, na our national um, agricultural food development authority. They're looking at a, a carbon, um, a life cycle analysis of the carbon footprint of pork, so we we do think it's actually lower than what it what the um, that study said it was. Um, so yeah, we're aiming to have carbon neutral pork. We're not too far away from it, but again, I know I mentioned it there um, as well in in the talk is that our the elephant in the room is soya. That is our big um, our big carbon um, footprint in in Ireland. Is we have to import our protein. We don't have any homegrown protein. So that leads us to the end question, which is. How do you reduce your environmental footprint? What are some tips and strategies? Well, I guess, you know, I ended my presentation with what we're doing at home. Um, I mentioned things like um, we capture the rainwater from the roofs, we reuse the water for washing. We're going to be installing solar panels now this year for the first time. Um, the Irish government being um, very generous in, in giving grants this year for solar panels. Um, you know, a lot of work with our nutritionists. Um, we work with nutritionists from Cargill and also Devonish Nutrition. So looking, working with them to reduce um, our reliance on imported grains, you know, the use of byproducts. There, there really is, you know, so much that, that everyone can do. But of course, it's very much farm specific and, and country specific. But I, I would hope that, you know, there might have been things that people saw in my presentation today that think, oh, yeah, we could we could do this here in the States, you know. Perhaps, um, but yeah, it's 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 such um, an open-ended question. There's so much we can do to reduce this, um, to improve our sustainability and reduce our carbon footprint. Um, feed, probably the big one for me is that we need to have um, a more sustainable protein source. That's that's the one thing that I would like to see. That th we've had some discussions with some um, companies recently about the use of algae or duckweed or seaweed um, so there's potential there insect protein as well that's been talked about a lot as well in Europe but again insects are sentient beings so do you really want to go down that road will consumers like to see insect protein being used not sure um, and again biogas that's something that that's really on the upward in Ireland as well and that's going to continue hopefully in the short term that we'll see more biogas. Shane, I want to end with uh, talking about, you know, sustainability is important, but we have to also share what we're doing with people outside of the industry. And you're very active on, on social media, especially your Twitter channel. Why do you take the time to communicate that message? Um, I suppose, you know, being on social media, you can see, you know, inverted commas, the fake news. You know, you see the fake news. You know, there are people out there that want to convince you that farmers are trying to poison you you know, with and that we have um, animals pumped up with antibiotics that were destroying the environment. But like, you know that it's not true. So, I mean, if you have a good news story, just go out there and talk about it. And, and what I say is I, I say don't educate consumers, but engage with them. Because you have to listen to what I consumers have to say as well. And I focus a lot on schools because young people, that's our next, um, they're, they're, they're the next um, generation. They're the next consumers that are going to be buying pork. So I do a lot of uh, uh, work in secondary schools or high schools, for example, would be the, the term here, um, speaking to students about pork and, and things like that and pig production, sustainable pig production. I also do a thing called farmer time where I'm linked up with a primary school 
and we have like a FaceTime and you know they just want to see around the farm see what I'm doing or see the tractors it's, it's, it's mainly the tractors I mean these are little kids they want to see the machines um, but again if, if you know farmers or oh, farmers everywhere could like make that effort to visit their local school or do things like that it would really make a difference and help bridge that gap um, with consumers because consumers are becoming more and more um, further away from from animal production and it's important that we uh, we continue to engage with them some really great insight from Shane there, and it certainly makes you wonder where the U.S. is headed in the future. But to help us share some of that insight about where the U.S. may be headed, we're chatting with Tom Battelese, the Senior Manager of Global Sustainability Metrics at BASF. Tom's seen a lot of changes in sustainability throughout his career, and at the Iowa Swine Day, he discussed some of those changes, as well as some of the opportunities the industry has yet to unlock. We first dive into our conversation with Tom, learning a bit more about his background. So I've been working in environment and sustainability space for about 25 years now across a few different sectors. Um, I've been with BSF Animal Nutrition, working in the sustainability space for about the past uh, 11, 12 years. So with your role in that sustainability space, uh, talk to us about some of the changes that you've seen over the span of your career. So when I first came out of school, it was the the late 90s, and environmental management was basically synonymous with environmental compliance. So it was all about trying not to get fined, basically. Um, But then the ISO 14000 standards came out for proactive environmental management, and uh, that was when, at least for me, my eyes were kind of open for business opportunities that go beyond just, you know, meeting the, the basic uh, law and um, and really being able to unlock opportunities from a strategic advantage, from a marketing advantage, and so forth. Um, that also, in the end, uh, help avoid issues with environmental compliance because at that point you're already well beyond what the law is uh, is requiring. But there's <laughs> there's a business opportunity around it. So as you look at that thought of moving beyond just what is required in the animal protein industry. What kind of shifts specifically have we seen there? So, I mean, I can talk especially about what we're trying to, uh, what what I was talking about here at Iowa Swine Day, which is around um, formulating beyond least cost and basically thinking about how we can incorporate sustainability into everyday formulation practices. So, um, you know, we're definitely in the early stages of that, particularly here in the U.S., as I was mentioning Uh, in the session. Uh, Europe is uh, well ahead and it's a much easier conversation um, to have with formulators and nutritionists there in Europe. Um, But there's been, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of growing interest here in the U.S. in this space as well and really around the world because the majority of the the biggest um, area for environmental impact on pork production is coming from the feed itself. So um, 50 to 80 percent depending on the production system and the region and so forth, 50 to 80 percent of pork production is uh, a result of the diet of the animal. And so uh, basically we cannot create sustainable pork without having sustainable feed as well. Um, So we really need to have a a fundamental shift in how we're uh, formulating and approaching these aspects on on a, you know, on an ongoing basis. Tom, clarify one thing for me, least cost. Clarify that term. So I'm not an animal nutritionist, but, uh, but I, you know, basically the, the industry today uh, looks to formulate on a least cost basis, which means that you establish uh, the core nutrition parameters that are optimal for the animal. And then based on commodity prices, uh, as they fluctuate, um, they adjust the formulation still within the same nutritional parameters, but um, ultimately reducing or striving to striving towards that least cost uh, by modifying the ingredients that are coming into that uh, nutritional formulation. So you mentioned focusing really on the feed. That's the biggest way to make an impact very quickly and in, into the sustainability aspect or the environmental footprint of animal protein. How do we go about addressing that feed or the environmental impact, but also from a profitability standpoint. Yeah, so that's the challenge. I mean, we had a question in the session about that, right, as well, and that um, that uh, there's a lot of things changing uh, that will begin to incorporate um, incentives, 
monet monetize incentives ultimately going back to the farm um, because the the brands and the retailers and the restaurants are um, more and more willing to uh, you know they're realizing that there has to be an incentive uh, for going back to farm essentially to the to, to the farmer um, to basically pay or uh, help the farm um, recognize cost reductions in some way so there's some kind of financial incentive that must evolve um, for the farmer and all the the players in the supply chain ultimately to have um, these opportunities flowing across the value chain. So Tom when you look at the environmental footprint of feed ingredients how do you measure it and what are you measuring? Yeah so uh, a lot of the data today as I was outlining earlier uh, is on a secondary basis. So it's uh, data that is aggregated based on average production systems in a, in a given uh, region, uh, state for instance in the US, um, and where all this is going and some of the leaders in this space already today are pilot, piloting uh, primary data flows so that you have exactly the, the farm level data uh, straight through the, the pork production um, in order to have the the clear primary footprint um, of that pork chop or tenderloin or whatever it is on the retail shelf. Yeah, I found it very interesting that you shared eventually, we're not there yet, but someday you'll be able to look at a pork chop and say, this pork chop's environmental impact was X compared to this other pork chop's impact on the shelf. Yeah, and you know, and many people will challenge today, uh, you know, we don't have the data. Um, and why should we be footprinting today if the data is not there? But the reality is if we don't start with what we have, which as I mentioned, a lot of that secondary data, then there's no way we're gonna scale and really move forward um, and meet the, the, the expectations of the, the retailers, the restaurants, and really most importantly, the consumer that is uh, you know, more and more looking for a sustainable product. So we're not there yet. We've got to scale to that point. What's a realistic timeline to get there? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, um, when you look at the goals that have been set by a lot of the major brands, uh, you know, for, for example, for zero, net zero carbon uh, going from 2040 or 2050, it might seem like a, a nice long timeline, you know, of 20, 25 years. Um, but there's so much that has to happen in order to reach that point. Um, there's also many intermediate goals for 2030. So uh, really, honestly, the time is now that we have to start, uh, you know, making improvements. Otherwise, 2030 is only seven years off. <laughs> Suddenly, we're all going to be looking at each other, wondering, you know, what we did over these seven years. And you mentioned that a lot of the data right now related to feed ingredients is getting aggregated at a more regional or state level, but eventually that's going to come down to each swine system measuring that data for themselves. What are those data points or things that producers, farmers, people working in the swine system day to day on the ground need to be thinking of as they're preparing for that transition that's coming? Yeah, I mean, so it's, there's numerous data points that have to come together from uh, you know basically all of the um, inputs into the system so at the feed crop level we need data for for irrigation for fertilizers any of the chemical inputs um, into the system the energy associated with uh, the on-farm production um, same thing for the feed mill uh, the producer um, those same types of inputs uh, that are coming in on transportation energy ultimately packaging once we start looking at going to retail and so forth. Do you think that there's going to be a standard method for collecting that type of data? It's looking more and more that way. I mean, really for life cycle assessment. So we have the, the FAO, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, LEAP guidelines, Livestock Environmental Assessment Performance uh, Partnership guidelines, and these outline um, really the minimum inputs or m minimum data that need to flow into uh, the system. So from that method, it's, it becomes then a standard template, if you will, um, for you know for collecting that data I would just add that that uh, you know this is a journey um, and uh, I know that this is early discussion and uh, and yeah it's 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 an evolution that has to play out in order to make the pork of the future that you know that is being sought from a sustainability lens 
Well, that does it for another episode of the Pig X Podcast. But to view Tom and Shane's full presentations from the Iowa Swine Day, visit ipic.iastate.edu backslash Iowa Swine Day. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Pig X Podcast, please take a minute to rate and review us and check out some past episodes from our first three seasons. Until next time, I'm Delaney Howell, and this has been the Pig X Podcast. Pig X is a national podcast hosted by the Pig Livability Project partners at Iowa State University, Kansas State University, and Purdue, and supported by the Iowa Pork Industry Center. For more information on the project, head to www.piglivability.org or to inquire directly with questions regarding the project, email ipic at iastate.edu. Big X, ideas in the swine industry worth sharing.